Why did your GPS take us through Bufu, Indiana for no reason? Oh, there was a traffic accident. It, it, oh, okay. People were dying? Mm. Yeah. That sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> So that's 100% going into an outro, and I just need my acknowledgement of, as Jacob Toshley casts aside human death, my acknowledgement of, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Supernatural Roadshow, also known as Ghost Facers, also known as the Superhero Ethics Podcast. Ghost Facers. There you go. Um, if you are a ghost, stop listening now. Or we um, will face you. We will face you. Um, anyway, <laughs> now, the problem is we're editing this in a car, so I can't edit that out. But um, Jacob's going to take way too much advantage of this. The point being, Jacob and I are now driving back from where we were on our last trip. Uh, you, you heard us on a recent episode. I'm not going to say what number, because we have no idea what number these are going to go up in. But we were driving to Cleveland, we were driving back, and you know what? We know that some of you all love hearing us talk in the car. You love the kind of laid-back environment. But more importantly, you have probably been missing us talking about Supernatural. You have probably been wanting us to do it more. Some of you have been dreaming about us talking more about Supernatural in a car. So we're bringing that to you. Uh, mostly because we've sat in a car for five hours. We have nothing more to talk about. So we're going to record an episode. I would prefer not to lie to our listeners. Matthew and I basically never run out of things to talk about. But... We were talking about this already, so Matthew's <laughs> like, why don't we just have a free episode? That sound you heard when we mentioned, when I mentioned that we'd run out of things to talk about, was the sound of both of our romantic partners collectively rolling their eyes. <laughs> but the point is, and there was a lot about Supernatural we wanted to go back to, and while we're zooming down the highway through Indiana, actually, yep. kind of middle America, seems pretty, pretty Winchester territory. We wanted to dive back into this, and especially today, we wanted to talk about a topic that, even if you're not a Supernatural fan, we're going we're gonna to touch on how it hit, hits in a, a number of other stories. It's the idea of obedience and of codependence and of what does it mean to, you know, we often on this show talk about how the importance of not being a lone wolf and the importance of accountability and how important we think it is for a hero to have someone they're willing to reach out to to say, is this the right thing to do? Is this okay? And that's a wonderful thing, but but it can go too far in the other direction. And and part of what got us into it was certainly my, my as I was watching Supernatural and talking to you about it, Jacob, realizing that I think that Supernatural is a great illustration of what happens sometimes when it goes the other direction. You know, we have the, the character of John Winchester feels like the, the influence that he has on the brothers is so much stronger than the amount of time he, he spends on, on screen because their dedication to him, their love of him, their incredible fear of disappointing him, even the memory of him, is such a powerful motivator. Um, Castiel quickly became one of my favorite characters because of the way he wrestles with this question. Um, and the there's one particular quote that I thought was so interesting, which is when um, Castiel is trying to decide if he's really going to turn his back on his fellow angels. And, and he's talking to Anna about it. For those who don't know Supernatural, she is, a, she is a not a fallen angel, but an angel who has herself turned her back on the rest of the angels. Castiel is himself is an angel who is realizing that he, he's not okay with the way the other angels are acting. He thinks maybe they have lost their way. And as he's planning this act of incredible defiance and obedience and going out on his own, he says to Anna, Anna, what should I do? And to me, that was just such a powerful sign of, in that moment, he, he can't even contemplate utter rebellion against the people who've always told him what to do without wanting someone else to tell him what to do. Right. Um, and there, there's this theme here, uh, and it actually shows up with the brothers as well, this, this whole idea of if you are brought up, if you are trained uh, with this idea that there is some authority that you need to report to, that you need to hold yourself accountable to, that you shouldn't make important decisions without appealing to an authority. Yeah. Right? And, like, as we've, as we've said, and even in our last episode, we talked about the importance of accountability. Last, assuming this is going up after the uh, the other car talk one. <laughs> um, but uh, th this, is, this is sort of a case where we're kind of advocating for a bit of the reverse, that sometimes uh, 
doing that sort of prevents you from from making the decision to do the right thing, right? Or in in Castiel's case, it shows, you know, the level of uh, I would even go as far as to say damage because I'm, the Winchester brothers are definitely damaged in this way. <laughs> but uh, even Castiel, the level of damage done by what you could call his upbringing, right? Yeah. Um, where he's not able to to move forward with an important life decision like that that he absolutely should make and knows is the right thing without some kind of affirmation from someone else. Yeah. Which ties into the codependency idea. It really does. And I think especially one of the things that I find most interesting, and, and both about the Winchesters and Castiel, is that for both of them, the decision isn't, oh, you know what, I think that the people who have always told me what is right and wrong are wrong this one single time. Should I disagree? It's that with both of them, one of the stories that we see is having to watch them realize that their authority figure that they look up to has feet of clay. You know, that they are not quite on the pedestal. To me, I think one of the most wonderful and most heartbreaking part, let's start with just the Winchester brothers. I think one of the most heartbreaking stories of those first couple of seasons is them slowly realizing their father isn't as perfect as they thought. Absolutely. And especially because of the conflict they have, that at first, you know, when we first meet them, Dean still 100% hero worships his father, and Sam very much does not, and they have so much conflict about that. And then over those next couple seasons, the two switch a couple of times. Right. Each one of them gains more information, sometimes correct, sometimes false, that causes one or both of them to, to sort of re-remember the hero worship of the brother, of the father just right. at the time the other one is falling right. away. Right, when, uh, when Dean's about to die, uh, John Winchester sacrifices himself uh, in order for Dean to be able to, to continue to go on, to sacrifice himself to the yellow white demon. And that puts Sam over because Sam cares so much about Dean, about his brother being alive, that that's enough to flip the narrative in his head back to our father was an amazing person for doing this. Right. And then Dean starts to get some bitterness and resentment for, again, the very real damage that their father did to Sam in this episode. Oh, it's, oh God. It's, it, I love the, I love the back and forth yeah. on this. It's a very, very real uh, and and one that, a uh, very real story and one that really touches me. Like, uh, I can share some experience on, on sort of both of those sides of really respecting an authority figure that I grew up with um, and then also learning that they're not you know, as unimpeachable as I thought, and that they're a human being too, and how hard it is to accept that and move forward with that as your as your new world view. Yeah, I, I want to respond to that. I want to just say a couple of quick things of housekeeping. First of all, as you probably already figured out, we are spoiling Supernatural all oh, over the place. Yeah. Um, I also realized we dove right into the story of Supernatural without doing the kind of explanation we sometimes do. In part because I don't really know if that's possible. And like I said, we're going to be trying to pull to pull this supernatural story out to talk about how it applies to others. Certainly, there's a lot of ways, of, a lot of other characters I can think of, um, you know, who this is, who these things are true of. I mean, let's talk about Daredevil and Daredevil's relationship with God. Right. Uh, MCU, look, we've already checked off that box. Please send us our weekly check. Uh, look at Peter uh, Parker and Tony Stark in Spider-Man oh, Homecoming. Yes. Great example that I literally just thought of. Yeah. But yeah, great example of Peter Parker looks up to Tony Stark as an authority figure, but also is struggling with the, I should, you know, feeling like he should be able to do these things. Well, and that one actually is a really good example because there's a chain there. Because mm -hmm. to me, not Tony Stark is now, and, and I know you mentioned that the Supernatural brothers, that Sam and Dean wind up having a kid of their own. <laughs> and so they get placed yeah. in the middle of this. I think you could say the same thing about Tony Stark because yeah. the early, especially the, the second and third Iron Man movies, a big part of what they are about is that, you know, the, the role of John Winchester for Tony Stark is very much played by Howard Stark. Howard Stark, yep. And, like, I, I'm curious. I, I have not seen enough of Supernatural to know if this comes up. It's, it's very subtle in the MCU movies, but if you look for it, it's so there. A huge, huge part of the tension that Tony feels towards Cap is Howard's is his father's love of Cap, and how Howard Stark would always talk, you know, that that Tony grew up hearing all these wonderful stories 
from from his father about Steve Rogers. And they never expressly say it, but I always on some level wondered, is part of what happened, you know, if you're a young person growing up, hearing from your father all about this other person who they think is so wonderful and so good, and you desperately want that kind of approval from your parent yourself, that really screws with a person. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I, I'm curious, Jacob, do, do, you, do you agree that that's a part of the, the dynamic between Tony and Captain America and Howard Stark? And you, is there, does that come up in Supernatural? Are there people who the, the brothers meet? Actually, as I say this, I think I would know my own answer is, but I'm curious where you would go, where they sort of have a, a, a jealousy almost of like, dad told this person so much more, dad, dad. Yes, absolutely. There are people they encounter who knew their father, knew their father very well. Um, and it, I mean, there's not that much jealousy. Most of it is, is like inquiring, wanting to, wanting to understand. But sometimes there's like, there's moments where they have to deal with their father's uh, baggage. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, you, you've seen this, uh, their, their father had a third child with a different woman that wasn't right. their, their biological mother. And that is a major plot point for uh, the end of the last season you watched. Right. Um, but, like, there are other consequences of, of their father being a human being, basically, uh, and interacting with other people. I don't think they ever quite do uh, quite like what you're describing, because I think a big part of the problem with Tony Stark and Captain America, or Tony Stark and Steve Rogers, is that Tony probably has this little voice in, my, in his head being all like, my dad loved... Steve Rogers, because Steve Rogers was a product of his work more than he loved me. Yeah. Because I can get into Tony Stark's head in an awful hurry. Uh, <laughs> well, and, and that's a really good insight. Actually, I've been thinking in a different direction where that was unique, but I think I think it's a mix of the both, which is um, Tony is... The, the, there's a, a wonderful Indigo... Uh, I don't remember where it's from, but the, the, I, 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 I've always loved the concept of the tension between a real relationship versus a ghost relationship. And what I mean by that is like, you know, your, your memory of someone else is always perfect. And the, 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 the sort of cliche of like trying to date someone, for example, after they, you know, if they're a widow or someone else has passed on, you're, you're everything, all you can ever do is have faults. You can have good things and bad things, but their memory of the other person is almost always going to be just the good things. Mm -hmm. And, and competing with a memory of someone who has died or has disappeared is very hard for anyone, especially for a child. And and Howard Stark's entire life, and certainly all of Tony Stark's childhood, was lived before Captain America was discovered again. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's also, I, I think you're exactly right there. Uh, and I hadn't even thought of that, but I also think there's that idea of, you know, Tony is a real person having a real relationship Steve Rogers is gone, and it's just a memory, and that makes it so much harder to compete with. And the uh, the Winchesters get that doubly so. Uh, they learn later, uh, after you stop watching, they learn later that uh, Mary was from a family of hunters. Their mother was actually Mary a hunter. is their mother. To be yeah. Clear, yeah. Ma Mary, their mother, was actually a hunter, something that had been kept from their father and them and, and as they were coming up. Let's give you a little bit of background for those very brave souls who have not watched Supernatural and are still sticking with us. Um, the, the essence of the show is that Sam and Dean Winchester are hunt, they, they are hu people who hunt supernatural activity, you know, primarily going out to find it and kill it and destroy it. Sometimes, though, not quite as, right. quite as attacking it, but, but certainly have an attitude of finding the supernatural things in the world that are dangerous and, and fighting against them. And they learned that from their father. Uh, their father, John Winchester, and they had this very strange childhood of constantly being on the road, constantly being on the on the run, constantly, but being taught as little boys that they were part of this larger mission to save humanity. Mm -hmm. And a big part of what we're talking about is how much that affects people. Their mother, they'd always had kind of a more sainted image of because they always they didn't quite realize how involved she was. And so at a later point, they realized not only was their her mother also a hunter but that her mother had gotten John into hunting, that John had known about it until... It, it's not quite, that's not quite it, right? Oh, yeah, no, uh, right, right, right. In this case, it's their mother died. John knew nothing about the supernatural world at that point. Oh, right. okay, no, you're right. And, then John, and, yeah, and then John, in trying to figure out what happened to his wife and trying to get revenge for his wife, becomes a hunter. And the, the, the beautiful part of the story was that Mary 
left the life to try to build a life outside of it. And there's this recurring theme in the show that you can never get out. Right. Like that once you're in, you can't get out. And we had talked before about how um, there, at the start of the show, there's some tension because Sam seems like the one who's rejecting his father. Yep. And that's because he has tried to do the exact same thing. He has gone to college. He's going, is it law school or medical school? Law school. Yeah. Law school. He wants to go to law school. He has this relationship with, a, I'm going to call him a muggle. It's not the word they use yeah, in the show. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. A normie. I, a normie. I'm, yeah. I, I like muggle, but a person who has no idea this world, and he really thinks that um, he's moved beyond it. It turns out that um, she winds up, in the first episode, she winds up getting killed by the same thing that killed his mother, pulling him back in. Now, if you want to roll your eyes about fridging, yes, that's exactly what's happening here. And the show was made 15 years ago. How long ago did it start? 15 years? Well, years? We're, we're approaching season 15, so about 15 years ago there was a writer's right. strike in there. So That that does not um, make it okay in any means. Right. I did think it was a weak part of that season. Agreed. And it's and it's, it, it's a, a plot point they return to more often than I'd like. I think if you started making the show today, I, I hope you would have to do it a little bit differently. But in, in terms of what we were talking about here... It's that same thing because now Sam gets pulled back in, yep. um, and later Dean wants to kind of have his own life and pull away, and they keep getting pulled back in, and it's part of it's codependency, right? It's codependency. It's 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 not the kind of codependency we think about when we think about uh, I am like me being codependent on my wife, if, if that's the thing that we're really happening, uh, right? Where where it's between individuals, but it's absolutely there is a culture there that they can't get out of because at the end of the day they feel as though they're needed and they also need that in order to have yeah. in order for their lives to be um, to have meaning like it's there's this whole thing where it's like their destiny or whatever and it's not they can choose whatever they want but and, and I'm really glad you said that because I think one of the things that I find that I as I was saying that whole thing I just did I was really, I was hearing myself say they keep getting pulled back, they can't get away, until I realized, no, they absolutely can. Yep. And in some ways, that I think is one of the biggest tragedies of the show. And in my case, it became one of the points of frustration that eventually made me give it up, but I think it is still a very interesting character point, and I can see why others still love it, is that they could give it up. They could walk away. It would be terrible, and I can understand how hard it would be, but they have been so... They, well, I, I, it, it's one of those kind of how do you define the terms. I think it is possible for a person in their situation to walk away. They're not literally getting pulled back in. But they're both, as you said, so psychologically dependent on this need to be a part of it. They have such the, the white knight hero complex that I don't think they have any sense of their own identity outside of this. And that without serious mental help, ther therapeutic help, for either of them to fully walk away would be shattering. And this this shows up every single time one of them is in peril. Uh, they they their decision making gets incredibly shitty. They're very <laughs> bad at making decisions when it involves the livelihood of their brother. Yeah. Right. Or any member, or really any person they identify as a member of their family. Castiel later on joins their idea of the family unit. They have a, they have a lot of found family. Yeah. In the show, a Bobby found family character. Who's there. Bobby is sort of a, a surrogate father figure because their actual father is uh, passes on in the first episode of the second season, right? So they have they have a lot of this sort of a idea of you always protect family, and this again came from their father. Family is tantamount, yeah. and this is something that's been coded into them, locked into them from day one, and it's because the authority figure told them about it. Right? And I think one part of that is also, and, and I mean, I remember this thinking this would be a great thing for us to talk about on this show. They are both people who have a fairly strong ethical code. Mm -hmm. They have some strict ideas about when it is okay to kill people, when it is not, when it is okay to do certain things, when it is not. And as a general rule, they want to protect individuals, but they do have a sense of the greater, you know, the, the protect the, the larger number. And that sometimes you have to do hard things to protect the larger population. And they constantly, flat out, throw their ethics out the window for each other. Uh -huh. um, one of my favorite episodes for this, uh, and, and, and it's portrayed in a very good... There are sometimes where shows or movies will show a character doing that, 
but it won't. The, it's like the writers don't realize they're doing it because the writers want you to think this is a sign of how in love they are and how romantic. Like when Which, Superman saves Lois Lane in, exactly. uh, in uh, Batman, that's Batman vs. Superman. Batman vs. Superman, yeah. That, that scene pisses me off so much because he basically abandons the fight against Doomsday to save Lois Lane. Right. right. Which to me is so out of character for Superman. Hashtag not my Superman. Exactly. Um, and, and oh, Jess Plummer, I hope you're listening. I know you you are the Superman expert extraordinaire. If you want to tell us that is actually in line with Superman's character, please write in and do so. Uh, Jacob just held up his thumbs to the audio recorder. <laughs> yeah, um, I have great, great audio, like good podcasting out of me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the point is, but, but in Supernatural, I feel like the writers know it. And the writers are trying to show you that this isn't like... This is like a good thing about them, but it's a very understandable, natural part of them. And the episode for me that most brings that up is, and I'm going to try and paint the, the broad general strokes. I'm probably going to butcher the details, and Jacob's then going to nitpick the details, and then we're going to move on with our lives. <laughs> um, but it's in one of those early seasons, and there's some kind of terrible infection that's come to a town. And if you're infected with this thing, you become not all, it, it, it's almost kind of like a supernatural rabies because not only are you almost certainly going to die, but you are very likely going to start attacking others and become a huge threat to them. It's yeah. kind of like a, a zombie-type virus. Yeah. It's Croatoan. Oh, it's a demon that's a virus. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's messed up. And Dean has been very rigid about, I am so sorry to have to kill anybody who gets this, but What's if you get this, it? A, we already know you're going to die. And every moment you are alive, you are a huge threat to everyone else. So if we know you are infected, you have to die. Right up until Sam Same Winchester infected. gets infected, and all of that goes out the window. Uh huh. Uh huh. And people call people in the episode even call him out on his bullshit. Uh, and Sam calls him out on his bullshit, being yeah. all like, "We just, we literally just talked about this." Yeah. And but he's unwilling to do it because he's completely dependent on Sam. Uh, he, like, I like, I actually, and we've seen uh, in the show at, at certain points where when one of them isn't around for whatever reason or, like, is in another dimension or trapped somewhere, the other one's messed up. They yeah. cannot function without each other. And that's a problem. And, and I think in some ways that the way you just said it is so perfect because, you know, it is hard to separate, like, a selfish act of love from a selfless act of love. And to some extent, I think that's a foolish quest. Because, yes, at every altruistic act on some level is selfish. Like, I give money to a charity, it makes me feel good about myself. That's legitimate. But I think that, especially when it comes to a relationship with another person, it is fair to talk about, like, is your desire to do what is best for this other person actually about the other person's needs? And how much of it is it about your own? And as you just said, I think, I mean, the love that Dean and Sam Winchester have for each other is very real and very powerful. And I don't think it's, but I think it is, as you said, very codependent, um, especially in this regard. Because, like, in that moment, Dean's primary motivation is not, oh, my God, I hate the idea that my brother will die and suffer because I love him so much. It is, my life is going to be so awful without him. I absolutely cannot let him die for my needs. Yep. And that's, I think it, it's a good example of why that kind of codependent love becomes so destructive, becomes so problematic because, A, as you said, it is this, it, it, it may, you know, it, it, as we see this in this episode, you make horrible decisions and you violate your ethics and stuff like that. But as, as you did such a good job pointing out, the person who is really harmed by this and really hate seeing this is Sam. Yep. And because I and I, I have been in codependent relationships in, in some really bad ways on both sides. Um, and I, I remember having this crushing realization of not only was I not helping the person that I loved, but that I was putting incredible pressure on them because they were feeling like I need I really needed them with them to be okay for my own needs. And and seeing that happen with Sam and Dean is is it's one of the things I think the show got so right. And it's the reason why we chose to use Supernatural specifically to talk about this topic is because it is rampant in the show. As as recently as this season, the current season, which is 14, the events we're talking about happened in season one. Uh, season 14, we have Dean 
in a similar situation where he's got a he's got a thing in his head that's gonna make uh like at some point it's gonna make him turn into this like person who wants to bring about the end of the world uh bring about some kind of apocalyptic event and sam is unwilling like dean wants to lock himself up and drop himself into the bottom of the ocean to protect the world because it's the right thing to do and sam is unwilling to live do yeah it's exact and like they keep bouncing their ping ponging back and forth so it's not like it's not interestingly not an unequitable relationship either which is fascinating and well, why they can keep it running for 50 bloody seasons i'm gonna argue with that <laughs> part, but that's another question but so let's broaden this out though a little bit yep. and, and say um because i don't i i think our, our show is not just a uh, uh um you know love fast and critique of supernatural sure. uh, although um i think we're making really i i want to agree where we are there but but what do we think is because it for, for this show, we don't just care about these feelings they have. We care about how does that affect them as heroes. Right. How do you think, for both them, but also in a, in a broader sense, how do you think this kind of codependent need for each other and... <laughs> and it's funny, we, we wandered away from the obedience topic. We're going to get back to that. But just now on the codependence aspect, how does that harm someone as a hero? So, I, or, I, or is it a good thing for a hero? I, I feel like you, you said it best yourself. I mean, I'm not going to try to come up with better words. It... it force it makes them violate their ethics right they have a very very i feel well uh metered structured code of ethics that they never deviate from except in these cases and right. so i feel it compromises their heroic integrity in, in those situations um i also think like to to play i guess devil's advocate uh not really but like um there is an upside to this and is that what they're doing is because uh, part of the, in this case, part of the fiction of the show is that these people are exceptional, right? right? Um, and it becomes more and more clear as they do things that no other hunter has done. Um, that in some ways, it's possible that the best decision for the world in the long run is to keep the heroes fighting and that you're not going to be able to win every battle, right? right? And that sometimes, uh, what that's going to mean is that you can't sacrifice one of you because you're going to save more lives in the long run than <laughs> than are going to be lost in this one moment, this one decision. Um, but I'm not sure that the only, like, I can see the argument. There's a calculus there that's not being actively performed by them. Yeah. So I don't, like, they occasionally say, say words to that effect. Um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, when when heroes are in these positions, and when their dependence on on each other uh, means that they no longer act as they would have in any other situation, it creates a real problem for again for their integrity. It, it makes it so that you can't trust them to to uphold their own their own morality, their own sense of right and wrong, because if one factor, one specific factor is entered into it, completely changes the result. Yeah. I, I think you're really hitting on some important points there. And I, and I, I like the devil's advocate for, let, let's say the Crowley's advocate. Yeah, Crowley. the, the Crowley's advocate. But Crowley's my favorite of the demonic characters on the show. Um, uh, played by... Mark Shepard. Badger from Firefly. Yes. The best way to remember him. Also the yeah, fantastic actor. Um, but uh, I, 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 at a later point, I want to talk about the devil's advocate part, the, the Crowley's advocate part you talked about, because I think there's some really interesting things there. But just on this main point, it, it's occurring to me as we say this, that in the, the three years now that this podcast has been going, with, with two different co-hosts for myself, we've never really defined exactly what a hero is. And I don't think we're going to do that right now. We, we've been in some ways, we've, actually we've had a couple of where we try to define it. And, and I, I may have mentioned this before, but I, I, I think what's really coming to me now is... I think the definition of a hero is that on some level there is some that your actions are not entirely selfish. I don't mean selfish as in ingratiating yourself and things like that, but I sort of mean like like the Punisher to me, even in a good version of him. Like I, I, as we're going to talk about it soon, I very much do not think the Netflix version of him is anywhere near being heroic. But even in some of the other versions of him. If your primary motivation is this group of people did harm to me and my family and I want revenge against them, 
we can argue in some ways that may be a very heroic goal. It may not be, but but or, or I'm sorry, that may be a very laudable goal, or it may be a very evil one. I don't think that is to me that's not a hero, because it's not about trying to like. Whereas Batman is, I don't want revenge against the person who killed my parents. I want so that no one else has to have their parents killed. You know, it's an attempt to uh, Desperado. We haven't talked about it in a while, but you all from an early episode, one of my absolute favorite movies. And I, I think of it as a, a cartoon movie, a comic book movie in a lot of ways, if it was based on a comic book. I don't think the, char- the lead character, El Mariachi, is a hero in that regard. Because there again, what that character is going for is someone, these terrible people, killed his wife and took his life away from him. And he wants to punish them for it. He wants revenge. Um, even if it's not just revenge, a, a story about someone who, you know, the people they love, their family, a specific group of people, those people are in danger. You're being heroic in a lot of ways, but but I don't know if that's the act. If your your motivation is to protect this group of people, that's not quite what I think of as a hero. Um, and, and because part of, to me, I'd be, I guess at the end of the day, to me, being a hero is wanting to save the people you don't know. And where I'm going with all this is it, it raised, to me, this is the main issue of the codependence is... I think the Winchester brothers very much want to be heroes. And I think in a lot of ways they very much are. And I think in a lot of the, all the all the needed heroes for psychological reasons that are really too tro- problematic. But I think in some ways it's their 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 need for each other and their need to please their father and their need to be hero it's it's their need to be heroes that stops them from being heroes because it makes them do things like forget about anyone else they're supposed to care about in order to save each other. Right. Not want to do the thing that needs to be done out of fear that it would disappoint their father. You know, all these kind of things. Right. Do things like, well, uh, this particular thing is going to lead Dean down the path of becoming a demon, and so we're going to release this thing that was sealed up by God that's going to make the world a bad place <laughs> so that Dean doesn't have to go through that. Like, they make actual villainous decisions. Yeah. Right? Uh, in that moment, and it's that flip that we're really objecting to, where they are, if you would analyze each action, you know, heroic sometimes, for sure, I think there's no argument there. They save a lot of lives, they save a lot of people, they save a lot of people they don't know, yeah. right? But when it comes to protecting each other, when it comes to that relationship, uh, now the world doesn't matter, right? Nobody else matters. And then the kinds of decisions they make, you could you could paint a, a different story about a tragic fall of a character who is then your villain of the piece yep. with the exact same story. Like, well, And so let me ask this. Is it fair to ask a hero not... Is it fair to expect a hero to not do that? And like, we talked before on the Jedi and the Sith yep. episode about how the Jedi are very foolish because they want people to never have per- personal connections. But part of the idea is that there's never any one person who you love more than people in general. And so you never have this ethical conflict. Right. And and, and that's a theme that comes up so often, you know. Um, uh, <laughs> if you've heard the earlier podcast, and again, I'm not sure what order we're going to send them in, so maybe we're time traveling here. But uh, in, in the podcast, in, in the once in future podcast uh, that we did on the car ride out here to Cleveland, we had a fun moment of um, talking about Spider-Man and not having a clear recollection of who played the first Spider-Man. Um, and I'll, I'll admit, we have one absolute super fan, Megan Lynn Scott, who's a huge supporter of us. Uh, as a special treat, they got to hear that episode in advance, and apparently we're screaming at the car uh, uh, sound system that it was Tobey Maguire. We now know it was Tobey Maguire. But the, the point of where I'm going with all that is... What's the point I was going with all Oh, yeah. It, one of the things I love about those first Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies is the way that he comes to the realization of, in order to be a hero, he can't love Mary Jane. He has to walk away from her. And I, I don't, I, I or is it Gwen? No, it, it's Mary Jane. It's Mary Jane. Okay. Uh, and, and, and and I later was like, maybe he was wrong. But but to me, it all brings up the same question of, is that a fair thing for us to expect of a hero? Should a hero have to be either? not emotionally connected to anyone or willing to sacrifice the people they most love for a larger good. And like, it's tricky because the definition of a hero in, if 
you want to be incredibly strict about it, uh, the definition of a hero does not allow the hero to be a person, and I dislike that, right? Because if you're, if you're trying to be like they always, like, if, if a hero is somebody who always does the right thing for the good, for, for, you know, does the most good, does the right thing for the right reasons, then you end up, uh, restricting the archetype to people that, it's unfair to expect that of anyone. Yeah. Right? I think it's, it becomes a bit more nuanced, and when you're talking about it being fair, fair is a very interesting word, I think, in this context, right? Because is it fair that I think that they should choose to save the world by sacrificing the other brother because that's those are their choices? Right? Do I think it's fair that they have to make that choice in the first place? Absolutely not. Do I think it's fair that I think the right decision is to save the world? Absolutely not. That is not fair. I think it's what a hero should do. Yeah. Uh, so I think that being a hero, I guess what I'm saying is I think that being a hero is sort of by definition an unfair, like establishes an unfair expectation for what one should do. And that's why we laud people who do heroic acts because they, they made a hard choice. They did something that probably didn't want to do because it was, because it was right, because it was good. Yeah. Right. And that can, I think that's the most, some of the most heroic decisions you can make are the ones where you acknowledge this is not that great for you. This is not what you want to do, but it is the right thing to do. Who, do you, who would you put in that category? So ordinarily, I put Superman in that category, but uh, depends on the depiction. Uh -huh. um, I'm trying to think of, of other media. Um, hmm. A lot of recent heroes don't do this, is the thing. Um, and like I can I can give you an opposite example from Infinity War, but we already we already bitched about that for a long yep. time. Uh, so goodness, I'm trying to think of Peter uh, Quill kill let your girlfriend die to save the whole fucking universe. Yeah, or yeah, the half the universe. exactly. Sorry. Anyway, go on. But I mean, if you want to think about it, uh, Gamora's Gamora's sacrifice could have worked, right? To yes. put, put, a, put an idea in Thanos' head. So, so there's there's a possibility. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of something recent because those are the kinds of stories we seem to be telling. Um, I, I feel like Cap definitely has this. Oh, like, uh, okay, I, sure. I, and you're right. Part of it's that it's, it's something we don't want to acknowledge. And I think Hollywood loves the good romance. I We've never quite gotten to see it. But I, I think that if there had been a moment where, you know... Cap had the option to save Peggy Carter or to stop the nuclear bomb from being launched. He, I, I think he let Peggy, he, he let Peggy die. And, and and I'm I'm realizing as I'm saying this that we're mostly talking about men letting women die, which is right. a whole other level of super problematic. Um, uh, on some level, I feel like there is an element to which that happened with. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact details, but there's something about Steve like. My memory is that at least in one of the versions of the Wonder Woman story, I don't think in this particular movie, but that she does get this choice where she can either save, um, it's not Steve Rogers, what's her paramour's uh, partner's name? Uh, he, he, I know he has a name. Um. <laughs> one of the Chris's. I think it's Steve something. Anyway, more people are yet. We're going to hopefully every episode give someone an opportunity to yell at their audio player as we get something wrong. Look, he's but, not the most important character in Wonder Woman by a <laughs> wide margin. I'm not going to devote mental space to him. <laughs> That's uh, fair. Um, but but because I think that, that it, it, you're right, it's a very hard thing to ask of a character. Um, you know, and and one thing I think it's interesting that you brought up, because I do think it's, it's another flip side of this, um, is, and this gets back a little bit to the codependence and the need to be a hero, one of the things I think is so interesting with, with those brothers as well as with Gamora and with Steve Rogers and with a lot of the others is often there's a very strong feeling of we will not sacrifice someone else ever. But all of us are going to fight for the chance to leap on the grenade to sacrifice ourselves. Yep. And sometimes I think that is just pure heroism. Like Steve Rogers at the very beginning of the Captain America movie, be literally leaping on a grenade that he thinks is live to protect others. Right. Um, but also sometimes it's 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 you know, like when you were talking about how in in Supernatural, 
on numerous occasions when either Dean or Sam is trying very hard to save the other, the other is like, nope, nope, I'm, I'm lock me at the, the bottom yep. of the ocean. Let me, throw me to hell. Right. And in their cases, that to me feels just as problematic because it does feel like a martyr complex. I think Gamora has a, I, I, well, maybe not Gamora, but I think in a lot of heroes, this can manifest as a martyr complex of, I don't want anyone else to die, but I will be the one to sacrifice myself. Right. And, and, and not that that's a bad thing, but sometimes, maybe I'm really going to annoy some people here when I say this, but I wonder if, to some extent, with Dean and Sam, there is a little bit of, not that they're suicidal in any ways, but that they have a certain, they would, they would be very happy to die nobly for a cause rather than have to live the next 30 years trying to fight for a cause. Right. Um, in, in a way that I think, again, can be can be great for a hero, but also can be pretty hard. Yeah, they, there's something of a death wish there. I, I think you're right. And that's, that's something that happens in, in these uh, sort of grittier painted uh, hero stories, right? Yeah. Where, you know, there's this whole, like, they could die at any moment and they're just like, they're, they're rough people trying to tough it out kind of thing. Like, that's that that's a very common narrative thread. And I think, like, and that was why I was struggling, because I could think of a lot of instances, and I like the point that you brought up, uh, where someone was willing to sacrifice themselves. I think it's harder. Harder to find instances where someone was willing to make the call that meant they were giving up their friend. They were giving up their loved one because right. it was... And, like, that, like, giving up, as in, like, if I do this... Um, you know, Lois Lane or, or uh, Robin is going to die, but at least uh, right. Gotham will be saved, Metropolis will be saved, right? It's a lot harder to come up with those examples because I think it's actually a harder decision to sacrifice someone else than to sacrifice yourself. Oh, I think it very much is. I mean, it, 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 of course it appears like it's more selfish. Um, and certainly, like at the very beginning of the show, you talked about how as a hero, if you think you are a valuable resource to the world, right. there is an element to which you can say, like, my being alive can save hundreds of people in a way that this other person can't, so I shouldn't sacrifice myself and save them. But that's a very dangerous road to go down thinking-wise, because, I mean, how many of our great villains um, uh, in Suicide Squad, I, I've been returning to this movie a lot recently, uh, Suicide Squad, you have the character of uh, oh my god, now I, I, I mentioned her literally in the last episode. Um, uh, Amanda Waller? Amanda Waller, thank you. My brain. It's been a very long couple of days. Um, the char- character, uh, I'm going to spoil something about, about that movie, forgive me. The character of Amanda Waller, as part of needing to save herself and protect the secrets of her identity, flat out kills like five of the people who are working for her. And to me, that's not a heroic act by any clearly that she's gotten into that mindset of thinking um, I'm more important than them. And so I think right. that's, that's a very interesting way to go down. But but the decision of I need to save this larger group and the only way to do that is not even to sacrifice, but is to not try to save this other person right. who, I, who I personally care about. I think that's a very heroic act, but I think it says a lot about where we are as a culture I don't think you could make that movie today. I think we don't see it often because I think it'd be very hard for most people to watch that and think that that's a heroic act and instead see that as heartless and cruel. Yeah, I mean, I, it's part of that is because when it's like 30 people in a bus versus the person that we've given dialogue and a name to, right? we've not done the, pe- the 30 people in a bus a disservice in actually presenting them as people to the audience. I think if we understood that these were all people with their own stories and their own lives it's easier to to buy that uh it's easier to easier to be all like yeah we have to do it this way and i will say it's a bit of a caveat but that is something that is so easily manipulatable by filmmakers and tv makers and i hate when they do it because often the, the the best way i found to know that the hero is about to make some sacrifice to save a nameless group of 30 people is if all of a sudden you get 30 seconds of just one or two of the people on that bus suddenly being incredibly relatable. Right, and like almost always one of them hugs their child or, you know, yeah. You know, and, and Justice League, I, a better movie than Batman vs. Superman, I still found 
very bad in a lot of ways. But one of the things it does is they're all they're having this huge fight in in Siberian Russia. But all of a sudden, they they need to make you feel like the people in Siberian Russia who would die are human, and so they you all of a sudden get like sixty minutes, sixty seconds of the family trying to pack up and evacuate, and like the little child in the family talking about its favorite. I don't remember if it's a teddy bear, but there's some very human moment. Similarly, at, at the end of um, Avengers Two: Age of Ultron. They make a real point of humanizing the people in um, in Sokovia, and that's not always a bad thing. But it, it, I don't like it when it's a manipulation topic because what that again still gets back to is the people worth saving are the people you have had a personal relationship with, which to me again, that's still it's saying that oh I know that person has a cute teddy bear. I love that child now. I that child's life is worth more to me than some other child. Yeah. Who I haven't seen play with. It sounds to me like you're less objecting to the, you're less actually objecting to the tactic in the media, and more objecting to the need to have it there in the first place in order for the writers to elicit the response that they want. It's a cultural problem, I think. I think it is, but I think it's a chicken and egg, because one of the things that that culture is shaped by is these stories, you know, and and I. Fair enough. and, and you're right, finding the origin of that. But but I, I think there is a sense to which you're right. I think it's that maybe it's that I would like to see someone really try to tell a heroic story about someone who does that make that kind of sacrifice in part to maybe put a bit of a change into the culture. Mm-hmm. But I also think you're right. that the, the hum, I mean, the human need to identify more with the value, to, to, to value the life of someone you've had a personal connection with far more than someone you haven't, that's not a creation of movies and television. That, that's been with us for thousands of years. You can see this uh, actually in, in video games, even. If you look at the, uh, the Mass Effect series specifically, is what I'm thinking of. There are these life forms called the Geth, uh, and I use the term life forms very intentionally. Uh, they are artificial, yep. right? They're robots. Um, and they are initially presented as just the, your standard, like, disposable army of robots. And then in the second game in the series, you get introduced to one of them that has a name and talks to you and is in, in, is treated like a person right? and joins up with you. And suddenly a bunch of people have a different reaction to having to fight the Geth. Why weren't we having that reaction to begin with? Yeah. I mean, it's we way back when we did the episode on robotics, uh, we talked about the trial of data. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, the, the attorney who is prosecuting, you know, pushing the case that data should be treated as a machine and property and not as a person. You know, <clears throat> I assume most of us have seen Star Wars at least know a little bit about the character. Star Trek. Dick, Star Trek. Oops. I just lost a lot of listeners. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's fine. I um, fixed it. This, we'll fix it in post. Don't worry about that. <laughs> no, we really won't. Um, but, but the point being, in this episode, the, the, the attorney who's arguing against data makes a point of saying... Would any of us feel the personal connection to you that we do if you were a box on wheels? And that point really hit home with me. And I think her point is, so therefore we shouldn't value you, whereas I think my point would be we should value both the human looking one and the box on wheels. But it's a, I mean, it's a really important point of empathy and, and maybe it's empathy that I'm coming back to and that, that maybe that's the way I would define what a hero should be is the ability to value the lives, to value the well-being of people who are not like you and who don't automatically touch on your or and, and, you know, and who you don't know, right? Yeah. I absolutely agree with that, that, that a hero would view, a hero views life and views uh, the continuation of existences as something that has intrinsic value, right? right? And cares about it. And, and is willing to look past that initial, like, well, this is my brother, I love them, this is the stranger, I don't love them, you know, to, to find to, to, to find ways to get past that. Although if you're in a situation where it's, you know, I wouldn't want a hero to, to succumb to analysis paralysis if it is literally two otherwise equivalent lives, I would actually expect them to choose the one that they knew. Yeah. And, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just when the calculus changes that... I, I've also come up with one example that I that I, I I'm talking about a movie I haven't seen in 15 years, and so I may be wrong here. And again, if but but this is gonna be kind of a deep cut, so hopefully none none of you know exactly what I'm talking about, so you can't tell me if I'm wrong. Um, 
But there's a movie called Backdraft, which is a really good movie about firefighters. Uh, it's one of my favorites uh, 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 of that time period. Um, and as I recall, one of the things that they talk about is how much the firefighter. Uh, actually, not even that. Not even maybe not in that one, but certainly in the TV show Rescue Me, which is a fantastic TV show, very hard to watch. A, a, a lot of ra- a lot of really awful language and racism and, and sexism, but but challenged well. But but getting back to it, and in that they talk about how these um, firefighters have this incredible bond of love and brotherhood towards each other, and will do almost anything to save and protect each other. But that if they are in a fire situation, and one of their fire fellow firefighters is down, or there's a group of people who need to be rescued. They're generally going to rescue the people they don't know. That that that's a sort of a part of the firefighter mentality. Um, and I remember really being hit by that and really affected by that, and thinking that's maybe one example of the kind of thing that we're talking about. Um, we may also be able to getting a uh, getting a toll collector's voice on this podcast for a second. So we're going to pause for just one moment. La 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 la. Oh, okay. No, it's a ticket machine. We don't have to pause anyway. I can keep talking. Hello, ticket machine. We're going to treat you like a person because yes. we respect you. That's very true. And it, they tell me, the ticket machine even has lots of pretty colors. Although, again, the whole point is that shouldn't influence me. Um, but, but the point being, that show, Rescue Me, and I think the movie Backdraft as well, are examples of people who are certainly very heroic, who make these kind of decisions that we're talking about. But if I remember, again, I haven't seen this in many years, my, my memory, though, is... That that's not portrayed as that this is what's normal for heroes. Part of it's portrayed as this is a sign of just how screwed up these people are and just how psychologically damaging this work is that they're willing to do that. Um, we also now seem to be having trouble with the, 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 the machine. Um, we thought it was our friend. It apparently is our enemy. So we're going to pause for one second here while we deal with this and then come back to you. Okay, we are back. The ticket machine is once again our friend because clearly we're going to value people not by their appearance, not by their set source of life, but simply by their usefulness to us. Um, <laughs> that's good ethical practice. But but anyway, Jacob, so what, what's your take on what I was just saying about the firefighters and them as sort of a portrayal of that, that willingness to perhaps sacrifice the one you have a relationship with for... Uh, and I don't, I don't want you to just be a numbers game. It's not just about right. utilitarianism, but but to make that kind of sacrifice. I mean, it. I th- it's interesting. I feel like in those situations, it's because they're entrusted with that role that um, the the pe- like you know every single person in there has responsibility to to save the people who aren't you know, who don't have the training, who don't have the equipment, who don't mm-hmm. have the expertise. And so I feel like there, there's sort of this shared understanding that what you're supposed to do is, is rescue the people that you don't know as a priority. Right. Right. So it's, it does not mean it is not heroic. It's 100% very heroic. Um, but I'm not sure every, uh, I'm not sure every uh, situation that a hero would be faced with can be evaluated in quite the same way. If it's two heroes. So let's put it this way. If Batman and Superman are tackling a thing, and, um, oh, I see where you're going. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Because Batman and Superman are tackling a thing, and Superman has to make a choice between saving Batman and saving random person Superman doesn't know. I 100% think that Superman should save the person he doesn't know and not Batman. Right. But you're right. right. MJ isn't part of the team. MJ isn't the hero in that way. Yes. Although, she is in more recent tellings, which I love, especially the Spider-Man yeah. video game, which is such a good story. Mm-hmm. But no, that that's a, that's a really interesting take, especially because at, at first what you were saying is, when you portray it as part of the team, part of what that to me is, that's another endorsement of why I feel like superheroes being more legitimately, like, officially recognized, trained, having official rules and guidelines and trainings and how you're supposed to handle these situations or not. But but that's that that's a uh, an issue we've talked about a lot of times in other places. Um, let's though let, let's take that one step further and use it to because we're almost an hour i don't want to go too long nothing else we're going to hit chicago traffic pretty soon um but because in that same way when, when you're talking about um you know the firefighters have been trained and like taught and so there is an authority that they recognize and that brings us back to where we started this question of authority because i would say to some extent you know there's no official licensing there's no official test but the winchester brothers it's the exact same thing yep. you know castiel we, we, you know, we never told exactly if it's God or whatever who trains the angels, but there's clearly 
an authority there. Oh God, and he programs them. Right. <laughs> um, but but so let's go let's go deeper into that. What's what's your kind of take on how is that a good or a bad thing when our heroes really have this authority figure that they look up to and have a real sense of obedience to, and that that does give them a code and gives them a way to function in good and in in really problematic ways. So it's. It's interesting because it has that that uh, built-in accountability that we say we care about so much, and we, we do care about that very much. We don't just say that. Right. Um, so, in in a lot of ways, there's a lot of positive in having a sort of deference to an authority figure, provided that the authority figure is more or less unimpeachable for the for the kinds of decisions you're making. Right. right. Where if they're if what they lay down, if the, if the law they lay down is one that is sound. Uh, then being able to go, I want to do this other thing, but this is what dad told me to do. If what dad told you to do is right, then like wanting to defer to that authority is helping you hold yourself accountable to the, yeah. the right thing, holding, holding yourself accountable to a higher standard of behavior than you would normally do. And, and I think it's so important, and that this, this frankly is a theme that comes up in so much media. I think for good reason, because I think we see it in our own world, there is real value to that kind of authority and there's value to that kind of training. But I think it becomes incredibly scary when someone is so inured to an authority figure or an authority institution that they do think it's compelling. But at the end of the day, I don't think there is such a thing. And and the people who scare me the most are the ones who say, nope, the Bible is always right and can never be wrong. The, the police are always right and can never be wrong. My dad is always right wherever it is. And it's, you know, Buffy has to go through this with her conflict yep. with the Watcher Council. Yep. Um, uh, for anyone who's wondering why I'm not mentioning Captain Marvel right now, Jacob hasn't seen it, so we're not going to spoil it in any way. Sorry. Um, this, though, all the Captain America, the people who've seen Captain Marvel, yeah, this is, uh, this I'm not spoiling anything because it's pretty well known in the character. This is a huge topic in Captain Marvel. It's a huge topic for so many characters that you can think of. Um, for Luke Skywalker in The Jedi, you know, this is a big thing. And it's, I think it really goes to, to me, part of what the Winchesters show is, I think the best thing that an authority figure can do is not teach someone, never question my authority. It's instead to say, I want to teach you how to ask the right questions and how to make the right discernment, knowing that sometimes you may even need to question me. Right. Um, because I think, you know, one thing, I'm very fond of the idea of the, the danger of a, a rigid, inflexible moral system. Because, you know, if your morals, you know, something that's flexible, something that has some give, means that it can deal with a hard situation and adjust. But something brittle is the best word, actually. That, that when you have a really brittle ethical system, the danger is if you're not willing to adjust, it will just break. And there's also I, just too much sugar. And it like hurts your teeth. Ah, not that kind of brittle. Um, but but and I think the point here is the Winchesters are a great example, as is Castiel. I don't think John ever taught them what to do if he might be wrong. Yeah. That you is hundred percent true. Uh, that comes up later. Uh, uh, and, and it's yeah, you're absolutely right. There's there's this problem. If the authority you defer to, if the, the people or the code you are obedient to, if your devotion to that, your devotion to that, yep. is uninformed and unquestioned, right? I'm specifically trying to avoid using a particular term, so if I'm sounding a little bit awkward, it's because, uh, basically, I, I want to say it's it's obedience without awareness that we're concerned yeah. about, right? Uh, and that can be incredibly problematic because no we're all humans we know this we have i've yet to find a system that's perfect right there's going to be there's going to be gaps there's going to be flaws there's going to be loopholes in almost any system that we construct and being unable or worse unwilling to identify those uh when you are applying the system to situations uh, creates very real problems and especially if it's if it's informing your actions as a hero, informing what you think is the right thing to do. And I think one of the fair things to say here is 
it's easy for us to say that, but it's important to recognize how incredibly difficult that is. You know, as I said, that moment where Castiel asks Anna, as he's considering throwing away everything that has always told him what is right or wrong, he now wants to put her in that place and ask her. That to me is one of the most relatable moments for me of that entire television show. I mean, I know that I'm someone who grew up constantly feeling like I needed the validation of others. And, and I still wrestle with that. I, um, Jacob, I, you, you know, Jacob is my mentor in many ways in the Magic the Gathering program. I, I have risen a lot higher as a judge and I'm making a lot more decisions and I'm still driving you crazy every now and then asking for validation of the things that, but, but this is exactly why. Um, and one of the things I think about is, and it's funny because normally, as we said, I'm, I, I am concerned by a lot of things about Captain America. But here is one area in which I think he is one of the paramount perfect examples because the entire story of Captain America's first movie is him being a person for whom the ultimate source of authority is the good old USA and is the military authority and is his generals and his higher ups. And a big part of that movie is him coming to the recognition of, no, that's not true. And... And I will say on the flip side, there is an extent to which he does flip, though, the other switch is that part of part of the thing that the bad generals are doing is saying, maybe we should care more about the overall war effort instead of saving your best friend and some other people. And that's so that goes against what we're talking about. But even putting that aside, and clearly we're supposed to think the generals are wrong. Steve Rogers is someone who is willing to ask those questions. And that happens, especially even more so in Winter Soldier. Yeah. You know, um, and so I think he is a great example in a way. And I think it's interesting. We don't. Maybe we get this in comics. I never. I we. I've never seen anything of his parents or his family. I never know what made him grow up with this incredible reverence and respect for the United States and its government and its military that he has to fall from. But but maybe part of the point there is that he didn't have a Howard Stark. He didn't have a John Winchester. And so when he has to ask the questions, it's possible for him to do so. Sure. I, I mean, and that's reasonable, I think. I mean, we don't know, as you said, uh, I think in some Captain America comics we get, uh, we get some, uh, okay, sorry, uh, the very nice woman who is navigating us has informed me I need to take this exit. Thank you. Uh, just so you know, there isn't some third person who is forced to listen to us record this. We're talking about the GPS. Board. How dare um, you? <laughs> oh, no. Sorry, okay, sorry. How dare you? Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. She's able to mute us. Is yeah. The point. yeah there we go. I just want to make sure people didn't think there's some poor person sitting in the back seat with, uh, with a GPS on her phone having your door. What has been referred to by one of our loving uh, 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 family members as our vanity project. That would be my wife. <laughs> yes, exactly. And if, she, if she ever, ever gets a voice on this podcast, she will say that, I am yes. sure. <laughs> so she's probably, like, she doesn't want to come on, so that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, um, getting back to uh, to what you were talking about, like, yeah, we, we don't get a lot of information about uh, Steve Rogers' family, his upbringing, mm-hmm. things like that. Um <laughs> And I think it's because it's hard to envision what upbringing would give somebody this, like, very... Like, he's, he's very wide-eyed, idealistic in, in a lot of ways when, when we start out in the movie with him. Um, but then makes the pivot as soon as he realizes things are wrong. Like, he's... In a lot of ways, this is one of the most heroic things about Steve Rogers, is he's willing to inform his opinion based on uh, new information. Yeah. And it's, it is, I think, a, I mean, we're going to try Easy Pass and see if Easy Pass works, and so we can keep driving through. I did just pay the Easy Pass thing. That's, okay, we are back. Clearly, my disparaging comments about the voice of the woman in the car has been listened to by all of Robot Kind, because Easy Pass hates us now. Told you. Um, yep, that's my bad. Um, we are, though, getting towards, um, uh, it's been a little bit over an hour, and we should probably start wrapping up. We're going to hit Chicago traffic pretty soon. Um, but let me just say, um, Oh, I, I know what I wanted to pick up. You were just talking about how that, that it, it's that ability of Steve Rogers to take in new information. And, and I agree with you there. And I think that at the end of the day, to me, maybe that should also be a defining characteristic of a hero. And it's one that I think the Winchester brothers show, but it takes them a long time to process and to come to terms with, which is, and I think this applies to any kind of 
to me, it's one of the biggest problems in our world today is if you have a fundamental belief, you know, the church is always right. The police are always right. Um, the government is always right. You know, uh, some racist idea or sexist idea or homophobic idea. For a lot of people, those ideas are so strong and the need, the, the, the psychological terror of losing that idea as a bulwark because that's the, that, like I said, it's such a brittle faith. You have nothing to fall back on that evidence that supports a counter theory will be rejected. And it will be, oh, that's all fake news, or that's, you know, the people of that group, you know, they always lie, so it must be made true, you know, whatever it is. To me, one of the things that's a mark of just a, a good human being, but that if you want to be a hero, I think it's essential, is to be able to, to look at evidence and say, I was wrong. I thought I was doing one thing, but the thing I'm doing is actually not, I'm not helping the people who need to be helped, or maybe I'm on the wrong side, or maybe whatever it is. And that's something that some heroes are able to do and some are not. Um, the Punisher, I don't think is ever able to do that in ways that, that I, well, one or two examples, but fair, but yeah. you know, certainly I don't think it is possible that Frank Castle can say, there's a drug dealer with a heart of gold. You know, um, I, I think, um, you know, and, but when a hero can do that, I, I really think it's a remarkable thing and, and and a needed thing. And the Winchesters are able to do it, but it takes them a long time. And I think they make a lot of bad decisions on the way. Absolutely, I agree. Um, and it's, as you said, it's one of the harder things a hero, uh, for, for a hero to do. But that awareness, that willingness to always be questioning whether you're doing the right thing is one of the most important things in making sure that you are, in fact, doing the right thing. Right. And, you know, we're talking a lot about the, the MCU. There's been some other great examples here, uh, but we barely talked about the Netflix MCU, so at least there we're okay. Um, but but it is one thing, actually, I think, I often talk about how I'm very proudly Team, team Tony. And here, though, I'll say, I think this is actually one, maybe not a flaw, but a way in which Tony is abdicating responsibility um, is a part of what's happening in Civil War is he's doing exactly what Castiel is doing. Um, in his case, he's already rejected his father's authority. So it's not quite the same. He's been out on his own for a long time and he's been making his own decisions and they've been terrible decisions. And this goes all the way back to the first movie. You know, he he made the decision to sort of let his company become more and more of an arms dealer and to not pay attention to who they were selling to and, and bad things were happening. And then he, you know, makes makes further decisions and eventually he, he, he makes the the, 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 the um the Ultron system. He makes Ultron and and again it it you know backfires horribly on him. And so I think on some level, that's what he's trying to do with Sokovia Accords, is to say, I don't trust myself to make this decision anymore. Please, someone else come in and make it for me. And, yeah, it's interesting. Maybe this conversation is making me shift a little bit. I think I'm still more on Team Tony, but that I also think part of the problem is I like the idea of a joint system of accountability where... Tony and Cap and others all have to work together to make the decision along with some civilian oversight. What what Tony wants to do is to be taken out of the decision entirely and have someone else say, you know, there's the bad guy, go kill them, come back and we'll give you your next mission. And Which is and yeah. funny because Captain America is the one that was a soldier and has been exposed to that and Tony yeah. was never. Oh, there's so much brilliance to these stories. Mm -hmm. um, but one, one tenth of a mile further. Um, but yeah, it, it, it puts one more interesting spin on the Civil War story is to look at it through those lenses and to see that in that regard, Tony's doing the same thing that the Winchesters are doing or that that, uh, that others are doing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have anything to add. I think you said it perfectly. <laughs> um, well, so clearly we should just end right there because we're ending on a good note. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I like that. It, uh, it's more that we're now in downtown Gary, Indiana and going on a lot of side roads. And so and, uh, we're probably going to die. So that's... <laughs> So that's fun. That, so, that, so it was nice, nice knowing you. Uh, we'll see, we'll see you again. These, these are not the best quality roads. Is the point <laughs> we're making there. Um, 
but but yeah so did you have any other kind of last final thoughts to wrap up with so i think uh what's interesting is that when, when we were originally talking about this topic uh, the topic of codependency and sacrifice and the topic of obedience and, and obedience to authority were sort of, you know, separate entities. And what we've done here, which I think is fascinating, is shown how there's a lot of interrelation, uh, both in stories but also uh, in dealing with, with real life between these, these kinds of concepts. Because it, it all, I think, has to do with how uh, ourselves but also our, our characters... Um, how how we're relating to other figures in our lives and and what basically what power we're giving them over us right yeah that's such a good point right so like the 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 whole reason why the the winchester codependence is a problem is because they've each given each other so much power over uh their decision making for these very critical moments and the reason why their obedience to the father is a problem is that uh, they've given their father and he's taken so much power over them to the point where they're not able to, or they're not able to, they, they, um, you know, they, they sort of, uh, unawares follow a line of accountability that maybe isn't correct for certain situations or with, or with Castiel or with, uh, Steve Rogers. And again, uh, the one of the heroic things Steve Rogers does is then question that when it doesn't feel right, when it doesn't line up with, with his own moral compass, and being able to adjust that obedience. And, and I think that is such a good point, and especially, um, I love the way you phrase that in terms of the power you give over someone else. Um, and, and, and to me, I think it, it, one thing it really highlights is it is not a coincidence that the Winchester boys give that to their father or their father takes it from them right and then they wind up giving it to each other because it's their father has taught them this incredible psychological need to have that um i mean this has been shown like sociologically and politically that like in countries that have long had di dictatorial you know popular uh, governments democracy is very hard and often people want to go back even in in today a lot of the rise of fascism in our, in our, in our own country and in, in, in England and many other places in Europe and around the world is because people are seeing like democracy is scary. Democracy has led to some bad places. We just want someone else to take the reins again. Um, and, and the flip side, and, 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 the, and the, it, it comes down again to so much of how someone is raised and how much they get used to that early on. I don't think it's coincidence that a lot of the people who are now pushing for strong authoritarian government are the same people who really believe in a strong authoritarian church or strong, mm -hmm. you know, a strong father figure. Um, and it's making me think, and I hadn't made this connection before, but we earlier mentioned Buffy as someone who is willing to challenge this. And I wonder how much credit we should be giving to Joy Summers for that, to Buffy's mother. Because Buffy, we don't, you know, we don't see much of actual Buffy's childhood, but certainly the implication that we get is that Joyce, who, who is Buffy the Vampire Slayer's mother, and their father, her father, you're more of a Buffy, um, uh, uh, we're both big fans, but I think you know more of this series than I do. Her father is gone at a pretty early age, right? Well, the, their parents separated at a very early age, yeah. Uh, right. He's still, he's still a part of her life, um, but is sort of, you know, not, he's not always there. Right. right. Because they're, we don't get all the details, but yeah, he's not around all the time. Right. And, and so the point being, I think that, that, that. Buffy, the way she was raised, is actually a great counterexample because she is someone who, you know, gets to see what this is like. You know, she she is raised not to never question authority, but to ask questions and to, and so therefore, when the Watcher Council, the people who are sort of her, you know, the the the, the people who are giving her her missions, when they start to give her missions that are becoming more and more problematic, she's able to reject them in a powerful way, and she's able to fight back against them. Um, in a way that a lot of heroes aren't. And I think it, it really speaks to the way she was raised and that she was she doesn't have this ingrown sense that authority is always right. And when the uh, business comes to a head in that story, when they put her through a test where they're uh, like hazing her, but it, it, that, that's really underselling it. They put her life at risk by taking away her power so that she could prove that she's worthy. Yeah. And that she she's done with that after that point. It's like, that was completely wrong and you're never going to convince me that was the right thing to do. And like, props to her. It's one of the best moments in the early, in the early seasons of Buffy. 
Well, uh, which he rejects the Watchers Council. So hold on though, because now maybe I'm going to flip things entirely on their head. Because let's look at this from the Watchers Council perspective for a moment. Sure. What they are doing is saying, and, and let's for a moment just assume that their assumptions are true, even though I think the point is that they're not. But if the assumption is that the world is utterly fucked unless we have the best possible Slayer we can have, and that we need to make sure this is the best possible Slayer we can have, and that one of the things to do is to test them in ways that may put their life at risk, and if they don't survive, that's a sign that it wasn't the best Slayer we could have, and we need to do that. Isn't everything we were saying at the beginning, if the Watcher Council are the heroes of our story, and they decide they love Buffy individually so much that they want to protect her and thus put the rest of the world at risk. In a quarter of a mile, left. Am I totally out of left field here, or is that is there an inching way of that? I, feel, all the, uh, but, I understand what you're saying. I feel like the distinction here is that there is like there there is a, a premise behind the argument that I am having a difficulty swallowing, which is that we need to because what they do, we need to strip this person's power away and see if they're able to survive against one of these, like, stronger, better vampire things without it. Right. Right? In order to prove that they're effective as a Slayer, where one of the defining characteristics of the Slayer is they have that extra power. Well, again, I, what, what I was arguing, what I was starting from was saying, right. assume their assumptions are right. Right. But, so, so let me then ask right. you this way. If the story was told in such a way that you believed the council for good reason, believed that they needed to know this about Buffy. Right. In that particular instance, their their actions would be justified, right? Okay. Um, but, like, again, it's going to be a really hard pill for me to swallow that we're going to have to intentionally architect a situation. We're lefting. Uh, we're going to have to intentionally architect a situation where we're going to we're going to potentially kill this person just in case. Because yeah. another one will take, well, another one will be, an, another one will spawn. There's there's a respawn uh, timer on Slayers. <laughs> um. Well, and, and there again also, and and Buffy does a good job of highlighting this. It is a group of men deciding what is best for a woman as a hero, as a way of controlling her. Yep. And and that that's very well brought out, and I think that's really important. I, I guess the only point that I was trying to make there, uh, yeah, we're kind of hanging to the right here. Get back on the highway. Um. This is really an odd set of roads we're on. Um, but is that... Um, I, I, but I think the, the flip side of the story is, at the end of the day, we as audience members are always making our own moral judgments and our own ethical uh, evaluations of the characters we meet based on the story that's presented to us. And maybe a big part... I, I do think that you're right that for the most part... Buffy is much that the watch like the Watcher Council I think is wrong to make that decision, but I have to acknowledge that the difference is in the win if the if the Winchesters are kind of equivalent to the Watcher Council in that regard, um, it's who's the protagonist of the story because as the audience Buffy is the protagonist of our story, and so that's where the Watcher Council are from the beginning presented as kind of dour old men who are not very good and are not very helpful. Um, it, this is kind of a different point, but it's one that I just think is important to, to remark on, is that sometimes the difference in how we evaluate things, there are reasons why one thing fits an ethical idea that we have and another doesn't, but I think it's important to remember whose perspective we're hearing the story from. Sure. I, I think that the, I, I just feel that characterizing this, this uh, generalized scenario as comparable is a little bit disingenuous, uh, only because, again, we are putting a life at risk in order to do, in order to find an answer to a question or concern that we have. And whereas in the case of the Winchesters, it's, it's reaction, right? Right. There never, there's never a situation where they're all like, well, we have an option to do nothing. And instead what we're going to do is this. And, and, and I agree with that. I, I guess my only point is like, from the information that we have available, I think you're right. They are not, a yeah. Equivalent situation. Yeah. My point is more: I, yeah. if it was the Watcher Council, the Vampire Slayers, we would probably get much more information about why they think this is the right thing to do, and might have more of an understanding of it. Well, and, and I mean, it, sure, because we would have we would have a completely different narrative, right? right? Yeah. 
And, and so that's just that. I, I get but, it. I mean, and, 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 yeah, you're, you're getting to a very interesting theme in, in subjectivity in our media, right? Um, which is a topic perhaps for another podcast because I think there's a lot of meat there. We're trying to close the show out, yeah. but uh, I definitely want to continue that conversation at some point because right. that is that you're right. The way that these stories are presented here, the authority figure that Bucky's supposed to be obedient to uh, is clearly in the wrong. And how much of that changes when we change who we're telling the story about? Right. Who's supposed to be, and I'm, I'm using, again, great audio. I'm making finger quotes. <laughs> uh, who's supposed to be uh, our hero. Right. And and here again, um, not not just to take us into all new territory and stuff, but just because it's something we can talk about more another time. But I, but I think it's it, this is a topic that we've talked about in the past, about, about that level of subjectivity. Because... Part of what it also gets to is we are trying to make ethical evaluations with imperfect knowledge mm -hmm. because there's no way to tell a story without giving us perfect knowledge because the story has a narrative and has a perspective and has a point of view. And I think that even that is an interesting metaphor because our heroes never have the full story. You know, our heroes always have a subjective point of view. And like in those cases where, um, as, as you talked about the example you brought up or, um, uh, you know, where, where you think one person is the enemy and then come to realize that they're not, a lot of times that's because of your own prejudices. You can be like, I was wrong all along. And other times you can be like, look, by all the evidence that I had, it just made total and complete sense as a, as a conclusion. And and then it, it wasn't. Um, so, yes, we are we are still in the midst of some crazy roads, and so I think we're just going to wrap up. So, any last points you want to make? Nope. All I right. get through this toll booth. So let's see if I can finish this, this exit before we get to the toll booth. Guys, thank you again for being an audience. This is a strange episode, I know. We're very off the top. We're, we're very all over the place. We have no outline. You guys are great fans. Thank you for listening. Please keep talking to us. Find us on Facebook. Find us on Twitter. Superhero Ethics at both. Both of us have our own Twitter that we are uh, not going to say now, but we can find us on the webpage, on the show notes for this. You can also find our Patreon. It's a great way to support us. Thank you so much to Jack Hass for the amazing music. Thank you all guys for listening. Have a good